Uh, yes, so perhaps Professor will be to uh, kick off with the uh, entirely uncontroversial topic of the question of Maniolis. So in the next 10 minutes we're going to look at uh, a little bit about the percentage rule that we've all been handed down, uh, see if there's any data which may or may not support that, look at um, how I manage these currently and try and bring that all together to see. Okay, so as you'd expect we'll talk about uh, ankle fractures, we'll start with an open uh, three-column tibial plateau fracture with this posteromedial fragment here. So this will be managed with uh, an approach to the flexor surface of the bone and a buttress plate. <coughs> fracture dislocation of the distal radius. Again, approach to the flexor surface and a buttress plate. Finally, we get an ankle fracture, so fracture dislocation of the ankle. There's a posterior uh, manual fragment there. But as we know, as we've been told, uh, handed down to us, if we measure that on the lateral view, it's less than a quarter or a third, then we don't need to fix it. If we fix the other components of the injury, then that fragment is able to <coughs> reduce itself and stabilise itself. So we fix it like this. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years later, this is the outcome. So the question at this point is, why this fixation? So, trimalleolar fractures first described in 1913 by Cotton. The first description of fixation was in this paper in 1922. The lands we met to describe a pilon injury mechanism, so uh, axial load to a plantar flex foot. They advocated fixation of large fragments, but they didn't define what large was. And they used this rather extensile medial approach to fix either anterior or posterior limb fractures. After they reduced it, they then drilled from the small fragment into the big fragment, which seems like a good idea. And then they made a bone peg from the patient's iliac crest and used that to fix the fracture. Jumping forward to the 1940s, Nelson and Jensen divided posterior malleolar fractures into classical, which was more than a third of the joint surface, or minimal, less than a third. And they advocated fixation of those classical fragments <coughs> by a posterior medial approach. So that's, I think, the origin of the rule of a third. Jumping forward further to the 70s, in a large or a largest case series, the majority of which were treated non operatively, only seven treated with surgery. Uh, they advocated large fragments, more than 25%, so probably the third out of a quarter should be fixed. But is there any data to actually support this? So the biomechanical studies break down into studies which look at uh, contact area, contact stress, and stability. So in terms of contact area, there are a few commonly cited papers, uh, of which this is probably the most frequently uh, cited. So in this study, they took the or existing rules of a quarter or a third or a half, they made corresponding osteotomies, and then they looked at the contact area across the ankle. Unsurprisingly, they find that as the contact area goes down, uh, or sorry, the contact area is reduced as the fragment size increases. The contact pattern moves anteriorly <coughs> immediately as you get a larger uh, surface area involved. One of the findings they did uh, comment on was that when they tried to correlate their osteotomies with a lateral x-ray, there's a consistent underestimation of the size of the x-ray. So what you think you're looking at the x-ray is not what is actually going on with the ankle. The contact stress, if we alter the contact stress, will that predispose to developing arthritis and poor outcome? So this study again took those existing quarter, third, half osteotomies, and then they made the model where they produced the osteotomy, then they had a gap or step in the articular surface, and then they fixed it, and they looked at whether that would affect contact stress across the ankle. Their conclusion, there was no change in contact stress and no instability. Again, the contact area moved down to immediately, but fixation didn't make a difference. So maybe we don't need to fix these at all, but we're wasting our time. However, <coughs> in their fracture model, they've left the medial and the lateral structures intact. So what they've actually produced is an isolated post-valleolar fracture model. And we know a suggestion from the clinical evidence that isolated posterior manual fracture is actually quite well. So it's difficult to correspond this to an unstable ankle fracture clinically. What about stability? Are there any studies that suggest instability? So again, this study has taken percentages from 10 to 40%. They've then loaded the talus to see if it subluxes out the back. 
in the first group that left the rest of the ankle intact, and there's no change compared to a normal ankle. As, you, as we increase the size of the osteotomy on the right, we get only up to two millimeter displacement. It's only when they divide the fibula and the anterior syndesmosis in the second group that we start to see significant displacement of the talus out the back. So they hypothesize maybe if we fix the lateral structure, that would be sufficient to stabilize the ankle. However, again, they've left the deltoid intact, so this isn't a trimalleolar model that they've come to. <coughs> Anything clinically? Well, consistently, the clinical studies in the last 40 years have shown that unstable ankles with post invalidal involvement have a worse outcome. That's going from the early studies with very few patients being fixed to later studies where a higher proportion have been prepared. We're familiar with Haraguchi's classification, he talks about the three groups fractured. This uh, group from the Netherlands then tried to further uh, delineate fracture patterns by using fracture mapping, quantitative 3D CT. And this is what they came up. So this is the Haraguchi one, that large postural lateral fragment. They found it involves, <coughs> on average, a quarter of the joint surface. This is the type two, with the postural medial extension, involving less of the articular surface, but crucially, this extends all the way to the medial malleolus and generally has two separate fragments. And then the type three, where we've got this lip fracture with minimal, if any, joint surface involvement. So they considered that the postural laps and postural medials are distinct types. The postural medial is inherently unstable. It goes into the posterior colliculus, destabilizes the deltoid. The postural lateral have a <coughs> spectrum of involvement with the articular surface. Their conclusion, morphology is more important than size. Is there any clinical evidence to support fixation? Again, we're just dealing with case series here, small numbers. There's a suggestion that fixing the posterior the fragment may be equivalent to syndesmosis screws. A suggestion that fixing from the back is better than fixing from the front. And the equivalence of using lag screws or a buttress plate. So then we reach the inevitable systematic review. But this is a systematic review of case series. So insufficient evidence of size affects outcome. Outcomes related to other factors. Displacement, congruency of the joint, stability of the joint. So where does that leave us? So I think we can say that historical teaching is based on arbitrary rules that were handed down over time. Both the clinical and the biomechanical studies consistently show that X-ray alone is insufficient to uh, adequately assess these injuries. <coughs> the posterior around the older fragment is not a single entity. There's distinct types. It can contribute, because of that, it can contribute to the medial instability with uh, disruption of the deltoid structure, <coughs> and lateral instability with disruption of the syndesmosis. We've still only got limited evidence that fixing <coughs> for the back is superior to the front-to-back screws or syndesmosis screws. Therefore, our indication for fixation uh, remain poorly defined. So what, how do I approach this? So, assess the patient, obviously. Then we look at the x-ray and CT scan. We're looking, has there been an initial dislocation or is there a residual subluxation? What's the morphology of those fragments at the back? Is there articular impaction that we're going to need to reduce? Are there incarcerated fragments, <coughs> cortical fragments, that we're going to need to remove to get adequate reduction? Are there signs of ligamentous incidence? Decision-making is then based on that assessment, assessment of the patient. The 25-year-old rugby player has got different functional aims to an 80-year-old care home resident. In the absence of any robust evidence, we apply some common sense. So fixing that bit of the back is going to help me restore the joint anatomy, the bit of the fond of the incisor, or it's going to help me to buttress a posterior <coughs> subluxation, or help me restore medial instability or lateral instability. That's going to push me towards fixation. The surgical approach is based on the assessment of the morphology of those fragments and what else needs fixing around the ankle. And then we decide whether we're going to go in posture medially or posture laterally. So this is an example. It's got unstable <coughs> ankle, subluxing out the back with that posterior medial fragment. On the medial side, we've got that double shadow <coughs> as described by Weber, which tells us something bad is happening at the back of the ankle. We've got a CT, suggesting there may be a small incarcerated fragment. And we've got that posture medial type going into the involving the deltoid with two distinct fragments. So in this patient, we decided to go posture medially. The patient goes prone. We did an approach around the neurovascular bundle, and we can buttress in those two fragments uh, separately. That's what we end up with. Okay. So to summarise, 
The percentage rule, I think, is of historical interest at this point. Our understanding of the morphology and the clinical relevance of those programs is improving but incomplete. Currently, decision making is based on the assessment of the patient's functional needs and the components of that injury and how to restore congruence and stability to the outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much.